Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Has there ever been a Holy Week or Easter like this one? Not in our lifetimes. But I think the first Holy Week was somewhat like this one. Each person feeling alone, each frightened, all uncertain, all on edge. Much of this week, Jesus felt alone and lonely, deserted by his friends, perhaps even deserted by God. Peter stood alone in the courtyard, denying his Lord out of fear and isolation. Jesus dies alone on the cross, isolated. Not unlike many of the most severe victims of COVID-19, dying in agony and alone. And interestingly, dying of asphyxiation, which is exactly the way Jesus died on the cross, ultimately asphyxiation. Jesus is laid in a borrowed tomb alone, and Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb alone to anoint his, her dead savior. Where were the other disciples on that first Christmas day? Most of them were locked behind closed doors, living in fear. We are quarantined out of fear of contracting the virus or giving it to others. This isn't an exact parallel, nor am I suggesting that our sufferings are the same as Jesus's sufferings nor our confusion and our worry the same as that of the disciples. But as I've walked through this Holy Week, doing it virtually and at home, I have had more time than usual to ponder these saving events. Perhaps our isolation and fears give us a better opportunity to appreciate these events and more deeply understand and celebrate them. Perhaps this Easter, without bombast, crowds, choirs singing, banks of lilies seen and smelled, and all the other outward stimulants will enable us to capture the essence, the wonder, and the true joy of Easter. Such understandings have the power to raise us to new life. The tomb has long been a symbol of death and isolation. Perhaps you have had moments over the past several weeks in which you have felt stuck and entombed. The empty tomb has never been proof of Jesus' resurrection, nor is his resurrection the rejuvenation of decaying flesh. We have organ transplants and joint replacements to accomplish these things. The resurrection of Jesus, unlike his death, isn't in isolation, but in community, a theological point better understood, I believe, in the Eastern churches. In Orthodox Easter liturgies, this phrase is repeated and sung over and over again. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and to those in the grave, bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and to those in the tomb, bringing life, bestowing life. The prom primary thought of the resurrection is not so much that it is a personal resurrection of Jesus, but a miracle which involves the whole of the human family. And so the primary icon for Easter churches is this one. A little show and tell never hurts. In this icon, you see an energetic risen Christ standing over the abyss of Hades, the dark hole in the center. The broken doors of Hades stand at his feet in the shape of the cross, symbolizing how he has trampled down death by death. All around are strewn broken chains, locks and keys, 
symbols of the many ways we are immobilized and imprisoned. Jesus is seen literally pulling Adam and Eve out of their graves. They represent humankind. Looking on is John the Baptist, the forerunner, Kings David and Solomon, and other Hebrew prophets and sages. This icon represents the foundation of our Easter celebration, the personal victory of Jesus and our victory because we belong to Christ. Today is a celebration of resurrection in its broadest sense, not a memory of what happened to Jesus, nor something deferred until after we die. Humanity, all of us, are raised with him to newness of life. This is consistent with Jesus' conversation with Mary of Bethany at the tomb of Lazarus. She talks about believing in the resurrection at the last day, and Jesus says to her, I am resurrection and I am life. Note he speaks in the present, not the future tense. Jesus, the incarnation of the great I am, is always in the present moment. Resurrection is our present reality, if, even if we still feel trapped and entombed. Now, wait a minute, you say. I don't recall any of the gospel stories of the resurrection talking about Jesus raising others from the dead. That's correct, because the icon isn't based on any of the gospel stories of the resurrection. It's based on Ephesians 4, 9 through 10, on 1 Peter chapters 3 and 4, on a number of other epistles, including our epistle this morning from Colossians, and it is based on one of the apocryphal gospels. The story of Jesus' descent to hell and his raising all to life is, however, featured in both of our creeds, the apostles and the Nicene. We say he descended to the dead. Most of us have never given a thought to what that little phrase means, but it's a powerful part of our tradition of Easter and essential to our understanding of the resurrection. Colossians speaks of our being raised with Christ to new life and our call to seek things above our mundane fears and distractions. And this is consistent with today's gospel reading about Mary Magdalene finding and coming face to face with her Lord and Savior. It happens to be my favorite of the gospel Easter stories. For years I have puzzled the question, why didn't Mary immediately recognize Jesus? The tomb, we know, is empty. She has been told that and seen that for herself. And Mary is searching for the dead body of Jesus. There is nothing in her mission to anoint the body which bespeaks life. She is about preservation, holding on to the past relationship, showing respect for the dead. In desperation, she asks the gardener, where have you taken the body? And it is only when Jesus says tenderly, Mary, that she realizes it isn't the gardener, it's Jesus. He lives, she lives. She rushes to embrace him but he tells her not to try to hold on to him. The resurrected Jesus cannot be held in place. He is never static. Now he is in every place, in every pro present moment. Mary and we have memories of him, but he is so much more than our memories. He is our vision for our future, and more particular, he is our life. Right now, in our darkest hours, our anxieties, all of our fears of coronavirus. He is with us now and in every moment through eternity. As to the nature of Christ's resurrected body, Charles Williams, a writer and theologian of the 1930s and 40s, suggests that the resurrected body of Jesus was a composite, 
the freshness of, of his youth, the vigor of his teaching and healing years, the marks of his crucifixion, his pain and his suffering, a composite picture of all that Jesus ever was in his earthly life. So of course, he looked different from what Mary remembered. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. The priest or deacon says, as he or she calls you by name before God, signs you on the forehead with the sign of the cross at baptism. Water poured over your head, your name known to God, the cross of Christ on your forehead, a symbol of sacrificial love and transformed suffering. These acts have made you Christ's own forever. Are you searching for Jesus? He is not absent by your inability to feel his presence, nor is he buried by your disillusionment, anger, or despair. He need not be eclipsed by your anxieties or your fears, nor is he just out of sight or a reality to be longed for in your future. Jesus is now, right now, calling your name. He loves you even as he loved Mary. Can you hear him? Perhaps you need to come out of the tomb a bit further, away from your anxieties and fears for the future, out from under your depression and despair. Now he is calling your name. He is offering his hand to pull you up, to pull you out, to pull you into his presence. Hear him say, I am resurrection and I am life for you, for you, my beloved child. Let this Easter be for you resurrection and new life. I have been so encouraged by watching the Zoom, video, and YouTube services presented by so many of our congregations. They are a wonderful witness to the importance of our faith communities. Many have been very imaginative about how to build community. A Zoom passing of the peace in which members can speak to each other while they watch each other in their homes. Participants, a few in church, others at home sharing and leading the service. Pre-recorded pieces of the service spliced together. Sometimes older technologies have helped in community building a phone call from another parishioner or from a clergy person. A text or email may have a somewhat similar effect. There are so many ways to build community in this time of isolation. Thanks to all of you who have been engaged in keeping community vibrant in our churches at this time. Finally, if you are raised with Christ, Seek those things above. Today's epistle admonishes us in these words. Yes, being raised with Christ is not the end, but an endless beginning. Reach out to someone in your family, your neighborhood, your church family, your acquaintances, your work persons who you work with. Since you cannot touch them physically at this time, figuratively give them your hand through encouragement or kindness, through taking an interest in them or sharing your joy, lift someone out of their despair or fear or living death. Yes, we are home protecting ourselves and others from a dreaded virus, yet the ministry of Jesus goes on in all the, mo in all the most mundane places. You have been lifted from the grave lift others. Together we celebrate Christ's timeless resurrection, life which tramples down death, love which triumphs over every obstacle today and every day. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and, those, and to those in the tomb bestowing life. Thanks be to God. <clears throat>